Thank you so much to be with us. Thank you for the invite. It's good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dorji is also here with us. Uh, Dr. Reza. Yeah, no, Dr. Raji, he just called me. He's in the car, but he's going to be here. And if his connection oh. is good, he will speak as well, a few minutes. Great, but great, he great. definitely That's will be here. Wonderful, wonderful. That will be wonderful. Hi, Saweb. Hi, how are you? How are you, Jeffrey? <laughs> It's going to Jeffrey, good to see you. I don't see you. I don't see you. You are. I'm here, yeah. Okay. It's good to see you too. Always good to see you. Your family it's been well. a long time. Everybody's yeah, here. Too long. Thank you. Too long. It's been a long time. We haven't seen each other. Yes. I know. Yes. Okay. I'm here, yeah. It's good to see you too. So I think it's uh, already 5.29 and we have just... Uh... Well, in one or two minutes, there are many people now online on our YouTube and a website watching it as well. So don't forget to thank them because many people actually use Zoom to get in. So sure. also the Facebook and Instagram, there are many people watching it at the moment. Sure, sure. Don't worry. Dropped my water. Okay, so in a minute we can start. So everybody is here. Any questions? No. <laughs> Not yet. Okay, hope it will be a great webinar. And we all will enjoy it. Also, I see Mr. Dorji from Bhutan is here. Thank you very much, sir, for being here. It's very kind. I know you are in the car, but uh, it's really appreciated that you give your time. So I think we can start now, uh, Dr. Reza, if it is I, like because it's already yes. five thirty, and we have all the three guests of honors with us: Professor Talabrefi, Mr. Dorji, and Professor Lipman are with us. Our all the eminent speakers are with us already. So with the due permission, with everyone, I think we can start this webinar. Shall we? Yes. Okay. Please. Okay. So namaste and good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Anupriti Sharma. I'm the head of the Department of Commerce and Management at the University of Kota, Rajasthan, India. And fortunately, I'm playing the role of moderator of today's webinar. And the webinar which we have titled today is Asian Women in Tourism. And I would like to start this webinar with a small quote that is, a strong woman knows she has a strength enough for the journey, but a woman of strength knows it is in the journey where she will become strong. And I welcome you everyone this, with this wonderful quote in this journey where we are going to discuss about the role, about the challenges, about the opportunities of, uh, you know, of the women uh, in the tourism industry. And that's why we have given the title of this particular webinar is Asian Women in Tourism. It is an effort by Dr. Reza and by me for bringing together the public and private tourism sector of the globe to discuss the eminent and important role of women in the tourism industry. The distinguished panelists with us, the guests of honors of today's webinar, will be going to discuss about the main issues which are affecting women's participation in tourism. They are focusing on the different factors, on the challenges, opportunities, mm -hmm. and definitely they, are, they will be going to discuss about the concrete measures that can be put to support the role of women, or you can say the, you know, the position of women in the tourism uh, industry. And uh, I must say that according to the global report of the women in tourism, women uh, make up more than half of the tourism workforce at the global level. However, women are often concentrated in low skilled or informal work and have very lesser or fewer opportunities for education and career development. Currently, all the women represent 55% of the workforce in the tourism sector. 
only 20% of women holds management positions. Even more shocking, the fact that only 8% hold positions of high responsibility. However, it is women who are decision makers in 70% of cases when booking a holiday, especially for the family and even these days as a solo traveler. So this is something, this is brings a contradiction, you know. And this is the reason why we have thought that we need to organize, we need to conduct a webinar on the role of, uh, you know, of the women. And I'm really happy to see the August gathering with us of the beautiful uh, females, beautiful women who will be going to discuss today about the different, different aspects which are related with women in the tourism industry. And without taking much of your time, I would like to invite our first speaker with us. And she is uh, Dr. Mastura. She is from Uzbekistan. Professor Mastura is the head of the Department of the History and Culture Heritage. And she is working as an assistant professor. And uh, Professor Masura is working from last many, many years in the tourism industry. And uh, she has practical knowledge as well as theoretical knowledge about uh, the tourism industry. She is giving trainings also to the students. And she has participated in lots of international and national conferences as a speaker, as a panel member. With this code, I would like to invite you, Dr. Masura, for your presentation, please. Okay, thank you. <laughs> is it visible? Yes, visible. yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon uh, from Uzbekistan, from Samarkand. Thank you. Uh, it's a big pleasure to me to participate like this great webinar. It's honor to me. And uh, today I would like to talk about tourism, women in tourism in Uzbekistan. Uh, it should be noted that tourism area uh, is a rapidly growing industry in Uzbekistan today. Uh, that's why uh, before the start of my presentation, I would like to talk briefly about my hometown or about Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is a country which located in the middle part of uh, Central Asia and it is surrounded uh, by five uh, Central Asian countries, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan and Turkmenistan. And the cap uh, Uzbekistan consists of 12 regions and the one autonomic republic, Republic of Karakal, Pakistan. Uzbekistan uh, is a country, uh, Uzbekistan is a country, Uzbekistan is a country with ancient history and a rich cultural heritage. And uh, because the ancient uh, great Silk Road uh, played an important role in its cultural heritage and uh, traditions today. Uzbekistan is a region with the potential to develop almost all type of tourism. For example, cultural tourism, pilgrimage tourism, ethno tourism, gastronomy tourism, agro tourism, etc. So a number of implementation are being carried out in order to create a comfort for tourists coming to our country. In particular, liberalization of visa regime or uh, improvement of transport system, improvement of uh, service quality uh, at airports and train station, development of new tourism products and tourism destinations, uh, support of non-governmental, non-commercial uh, uh, organization, etc. So uh, I would like uh, so uh, five, five unique uh, objects of Uzbekistan are included in the World Heritage uh, List. Uh, they are Fortress City of Ichankala in Hiwa, Historical Center of Ancient Bukhara, Historical Center of Shakvisabs, and the Historical Park of Samarkand. They are uh, the uh, tangible heritage, uh, intangible heritage of uh, UNESCO was included. The following cultural heritage of Uzbekistan is included in the list of intangible cultural heritage of UNESCO. They are Baisun cultural space, Shashmakom uh, classic music, Big Song, Katashula, Askiat art, Navruz national uh, tradition, and Pilaf, our national dish, 
and the Margilan Handcrafts uh, Development Center Adras and Satin Sewing, uh, sewing and Harazim Dance. Uh, they are very uh, famous, uh, intangible uh, cultural heritage of our country. But I would like uh, to emphasize uh, this, except this cultural uh, heritage, there are many tangible and intangible cultural heritage in Uzbek, uh, Uzbek community. Uh, scientific research uh, is needed to attract them to tourism and to include uh, them in the UNESCO heritage list. Uh, of course, uh, in this regard, many uh, studies have been uh, launched today. I think uh, that uh, in the future, as a tangible or in the intangible cultural heritage of our country will be included in the UNESCO uh, list. So uh, in this slide, uh, I would like to provide some information about the population of Uzbekistan and the number of in it. So according to 2022 statistic indication, the total uh, population of Uzbekistan, uh, so 35 to uh, uh, 171.3 million and 49% uh, of them are women and 50% are men. So uh, according uh, to the given data, the majority of women are young people and these, the, that is uh, those under the age of 19. It was about the previous uh, slide, I'm, I'm sorry. So Uzbekistan, uh, it would be, it would be, uh, emphasized that uh, it is known that Uzbekistan was a part of former USSR until 1991, and it had some political, social, and economic limitation. After gaining independence, Uzbekistan began to appear in the world community. Before the gaining of independence, the flow of tourists in Uzbekistan was very low. After gaining of independence of Uzbekistan, the tourism flow is uh, rapidly rising. So uh, according to the statistic uh, indication in two, 2021, total visitors uh, in Uzbekistan were 11, 35, uh, 6,000 people. And 48% uh, uh, of them were women and 52% uh, percent of them were men. And the, this indication we can see in 2022. Uh, uh, so in 2022, total number of visitors in Uzbekistan was 35, uh, 80, uh, 7.2 thousand people. And the percentage was the same. I mean, the 48% of them were women and 52% of them were uh, men. So, uh, in this uh, slide, I gave information about the migration of Uzbek women to the foreign countries. Uh, according to statistic analysis of women uh, who went abroad, so the 82.6% uh, uh, of total number of women, uh, they uh, visited their uh, so, uh, relatives and uh, others, uh, by the percentages, you can see some of them went to spend their free time and get to rest. Uh, some of them for the purpose of study and for medical treatment and others on the business trip. But the majority of them, 82.6, they visited their relatives. In this map, you can see uh, the women's, uh, Uzbek women's, uh, went in this uh, country, uh, such as Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, mm -hmm. Tur Turkey, mm -hmm. Russia, uh, Arabic countries, uh, Egypt, Korea, USA, India, Georgian, Azerbaijan, etc. So, uh, in, uh, women of Uzbekistan are active in various sphere of society, for example, in education and medicine, banking, law enforcement, finance and management, trade and business, 
craft and tourism, etc. In particular, education, medicine, banking, uh, finance and management, law enforcement, trade and businessmen, entrepreneurship, tourism, craft, etc. They are, I mean, the majority of the, uh, we can see the activity of uh, Uzbek women. Unfortunately, I cannot give the specific information about the uh, women uh, working in the field of tourism. Uh, I can only say that many of our women involved in the craft uh, to related to tourism or in hospitality or in the restaurant and the uh, management of a hotel or something. For example, except this uh, in particular in embo uh, embroidery, uh, goldsmithing, gastronomy, even uh, food carving and uh, etc. So uh, most of uh, the women working in the field of tourism provide, as I said, uh, services in hotel, restaurant, guiding, crafts, cooking. Uh, I would like uh, emphasize, especially emphasize that uh, silk, uh, in order uh, to develop a tourism in our country, uh, with the initiative of, of, of our uh, president, uh, Mirzioyev, uh, Silk Road Tourism and International, uh, Tourism and Cultural Heritage International University was established in Samarkand 2018. And uh, uh, today is the top, uh, and we provide the specialists on tourism areas such as in museum and cultural heritage areas and uh, in hotels management, in logistics and the restaurant business, etc. So <clears throat> this, uh, in this slide, I gave some information about the craft uh, uh, craft uh, craftmen uh, craft women because today the total number of craftmen working in the field of tourism is 1192 but uh, 418 of them or 35 percent are women for example one of the uh, most uh, popular uh, handcraft uh, in Uzbekistan, located in Fergana Valley. The city of Mergilan uh, in Fergana region has been described as the land of silk workers and artisans since time immemorial. About 2,000 women and young people were recruited by, by them. So uh, the next one uh, is the uh, cap carpet waving uh, this in this slide you can see uh, the art of carpet waving in the national style i can say that in uzbekistan three famous carpet waving school i mean national school we have in bukhara region in uh, hiwa and in samarkand they uh, wave this carpet in the old style and it is very requirement to the development uh, tourism area in our country the next uh, handcraft is uh, goldsmithing we call zarduzlik it is famous in bukhara and uh, it is more spread in uh, bukhara samarkand and uh, this uh, uh, goldsmithing is a type of decorative art, a branch of applied art that creates ornaments by embroidery with a gold. That's why we call this Zarduzi. Zarduzi is Pers in Persian gold, waving with gold. So uh, the main artistic embroidery schools in the territory of Uzbekistan uh, were formed in the six cities. They, I mean, the Kashtachilik school uh, in Nurata, in Samarkand, Shahisaf, Tashkent, Fergana, and uh, in uh, Bukhara. It is a historical uh, handcraft and it is more popular in our country and there, it is also more spread uh, in uh, Uzbekistan. So then the next one is jewelry. So je uh, jewelry is mainly made uh, usually by men, but uh, in current uh, days we can say 
even women are attracting in this area. For example, I can say, uh, in this uh, slide, you can see her. She is very good in the jewelry and uh, she uh, win uh, a lot of uh, grant in our uh, country and in the foreign countries and uh, this is uh, her uh, work, you can see. Except these craftsmen, we have uh, uh, craftsmen uh, also uh, such as uh, national dolls and uh, in gastronomy some dishes are famous which were cooking by our women and etc. So uh, it was my uh, briefly presentation. And uh, as I said before in the previous uh, slide, tourism is new area in our country because our country is uh, young in this. Uh, that's why uh, if you have a question, you are welcome. I will try my best to answer to your question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yes, thank you so thank much. You. Uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Masura. It is a wonderful presentation. And I'm so Thank fascinated, you. you know, in my uh, first visit during 2020 at Uzbekistan, I was really not very much aware about uh, this many of, you know, products of uh, jewelry and embroidery and the carpets and all. But now because uh, you have given an in-depth uh, information about it, I'm very much sure in my next visit, I'll be going to buy many souvenirs from Samarkand and Uzbekistan. Thank you so very much to be with us. And uh, I would also like to say thanks to the United Nations Women and, uh, of course, uh, the Singapore Tourism Board uh, persons who are associated with us right now. And there are, there are hundreds of people who are watching us on online, on YouTube, Instagram and Facebook. And I would like to say thanks to all of them for giving their time. And I would like to also request them that whosoever are watching us, please stay with us till the end of this webinar. With the and now, without taking much of the time, I would like to tell you that our next next speaker is from Bali Tourism Polytechnic uh, Ministry of Tourism, Republic of Indonesia. She is Dr. Dia Shastri, and uh, she is a very active uh, lady. On and she is on different boards on national and international uh, associations. She has written several books, including the topics of homestays. Of, on community base and on culinary tourism. She also received the first place in the Win Way Award 2018 as the best lecturer under the Ministry of Tourism, Republic of Indonesia. She also received the best paper award in the first international conference in 2018. And her research interests focus on smart tourism, big data, and tourism studies. And uh, she is also an active reviewer of national and international mm -hmm. journals and a speaker in many of international conferences. I would like to welcome you, Professor uh, Dia Shastri, for your presentation, please. Mm -hmm. yep. um, now. Okay, thank you so much. Um, good evening from Bali. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Reza. Uh, good evening, Mr. Tayeb. It's really nice uh, and it is such pleasure to be here. Uh, my presentation is titled Overcoming the Paradox Women and Tourism Development in Bali. My name is Dia. I'm a lecturer from Bali Tourism Polytechnic, Ministry of Tourism, Republic of Indonesia. Okay. I'd like to start this presentation by highlighting um, the first exposure of Balinese women to tourism. It was regarded um, to a Mexican painter, an illustrator, ethnologist, and art historian of Miguel Coparubias. Miguel Coparubias has wrote a book which is called La Isla de Bali or the Island of Bali, who, who was published uh, in, first in 1937. It is uh, regarded as the original Bali Bible and was notably as the go-to travel for early visitors who came to the island. The island of Bali has portrayed a rich of Balinese culture, the island panoramic scenery, and it is one of the, more, uh, the reasons why Bali was dubbed as the island of the gods. 
Balinese women in his book is also regarded as angels on earth. Tan chocolate skin, curly hair, exotic, beautiful body, and of course, their infamous perky boobs. And the discovery of Bali beauty and angels like women is also revealed uh, to Holland in word and picture by the Dutch painter Nieuwenkamp and to the rest of the Western world through numerous photographs published by the German photographer, Dr. Gregor Kraus. And he also published a book of photograph consists of the beauty of Bali. He has captured many beautiful Balinese women and also Bali which are related to the big offering uh, de devoted for, uh, to the gods. And this image of beautiful tropical scenery, authentic culture, breathtaking temples, and angels like women portrayed through paintings and photographs has resulted in Bali being nicknamed as the last paradise and the island of the gods. And after Indonesia has won independence in 1945, Bali's tourism sector has continued to expand, positioning itself as the world known destination for leisure travel. In nationwide, before the uh, pandemic of COVID-19, the growth rates of tourism sector in the island was between 8% to 10% annually and have been the highest in Indonesia. Alongside with this de uh, development, Balinese women also benefit from the tourist industry. There is a long tradition of women participating in the informal tourism sector and gaining greater control of their life. But then here comes the paradox. It is, um, there's a conflicting roles of Balinese women. The reason is simply because Balinese culture is a patriarchal, or we call it the kapurusan. It is a culture that plays men as a dominant side in life since they bring a decent line, including giving a social status to the family. A de facto hierarchy of the sexes also exists that places women on the lower rungs of the scale or the second class citizen. This culture also encourage women to adhere to the five duties of women or so-called the pancha dharma wanita, including uh, being loyal companion to the husband. They are encouraged to manage the household. They are responsible in educating and providing guidance for children. They have to earn supplementary income as required and they have to become a, a useful member of the community. And in the past decades, this code, this cultural code is consistent with the premise that women have traditionally become autonomous in Bali's economic sector. And now here are the triple roles of Balinese women. They are attached to their domestic role. They are attached to their social cultural roles. And now they are also attached to the economic roles. In terms of domestic roles, they are their responsibility as wife, in other words, a married woman must have the principle to keep her marriage. It is a sin if you get divorced in Bali. They have to become an ideal wife. They have to be a good mother. They have to have the ability to manage a conflict mm -hmm. if there's a conflict within uh, the family itself. Other domestic roles are also included uh, like cooking, taking care of children, cleaning, washing, and other house chores. This also include dairy worshipping to the gods and to the ancestors. As you can see here, daily worshipping is conducted uh, by with also carrying a children on her side. The second role is the sociocultural roles. Married Balinese women will become a member of the adat, or it is called the krama adat, either whether uh, either it is a desa adat or the customary village, or the banjar adat or the customary community. Balinese have community that manage and are responsible for the rituals. As a Balinese, most social and ritual activities are entirely organized by the adat. And together with the krama adat, Balinese women are responsible to prepare ceremonies like Manusayatnya, uh, which is the birth and marriage ceremonies. There's a Dewayatnya, which is the temple ceremony, and the Pitrayatnya, or the cremation ceremonies, or uh, we call it the Ngaben. Now, with the economic roles, the added roles of Balinese uh, is 
are activities where women have to earn money and create welfare for their family. As tourism become one of the global economic strength, it also raised many small and mid middle scale industry. And Balinese women see this as a good opportunity. And even so, they can only work within the tourism sector with at least two conditions. First, activities to earn money must not oppose their domestic role. So their first and second role, which is the domestic and the social cultural roles must be at their first priority. Second, their working hours must be adjusted to custom activities. Moreover, all of the wives must have permissions from their husband, sometime the husband family to work. And there are some reasons why Balinese women earn some money because they have to fulfill their daily needs. It is a chance for them to start career. They need to apply their ability. And there's a belief that working women are considered better than those who stay at home. The paradox is because of these conflicting roles. In Bali, the patriarchal culture plays a powerful role in people's life, particularly in the tourism sector. Previously, women was not given much space to play an active role in tourism planning and development in their own regions. Balinese women have obligations in Bali's various social and cultural aspects, especially in terms of customs and religions in Hinduism. Hindu women in Bali must take an active role in customarily social activities in their area. So this sometimes limits women movement to carry out in other economic activities in various formal sectors. And the conflicting roles create paradox. Many Balinese women are forced to choose whether they can, they wanted to become a good housewife or they want to choose a good career. If they choose both, then they must be able to create balance in between. But then after the economic slowdown uh, slow in Bali that was caused by the terrorist bombings in 2002 and 2005, the Mount Agung eruptions in 2017, and of course the COVID-19, women in Bali were now urged to support their husband to generate more income for their families. And now they overcome the paradox by becoming a woman trainer. The influence of tourism can be seen now through many traditional food stalls, which is called the warungs, where it creates a great examples of how Balinese women is able to adjust traditional business tactics to emerging situation by being closer to the family and to their community. And many Balinese women open warungs near tourist attractions and hotel and become very successful culinary entrepreneurs. And this is some of the food stalls, uh, successful Balinese women. You can see here there's uh, the infamous uh, Babi Guling Ibu Oka, there's Nasi Ayam Kedewatan Ibu Mangku, the Bebek Bengil. All of these are the icons of Balinese culinary, which is created and um, uh, managed by women. And now, uh, not only in the informal sectors, they also become a trademark of the local uh, traditional herb drink in Penglipuran village. They become hotel managers. They become public servants. They can go to tourism university and get graduate with highest scores and be able to start their career in tourism. They are uh, actively participated in the social cultural lives and they can uh, uh, go with any careers in the tourism and hospitality industry. And uh, as my concluding remarks, tourism has significantly affects the economy of Bali and increased family welfare. Overcoming the paradox, tourism creates an opportunity for Balinese women to develop and empower themselves. Women in Bali can now participate and contribute to the development and tourism, especially in the cultural and environmental preservation and culinary tourism. In preserving culture and developing culinary tourism, Balinese women plays an a vital role as the main actors. And the role of women in the economy of Bali have been growing for many years. And now women trainer have become a significant economic force in the island. No longer invisible, Balinese women significantly contribute to economic growth and development. And in the future, Balinese women are likely to be increasingly important to the economy of Bali. 
that is the end of my presentation. Matur Suksma, thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, Thank wonderful, you. wonderful presentation, uh, Professor. And uh, it is indeed good to know about the role of uh, women in Bali, you know, from the clinic ready tourism to the hotel managers, from the education to everything they are and handling the families in a very well way. You have given an in-depth knowledge about uh, the role of women, not only in tourism and hospitality sector, but in the daily lives also. Thank you so very much for the presentation. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. So now... Um, the next speaker is the Chief Executive Officer of Destination uh, Mekong, and she is a management and marketing consultant, a trainer of uh, travel, tourism and hospitality and food and beverages. For over 25 years, she has built an international career dedicated to sustainable global and local development in a variety of sectors, including tourism, hospitality, and environmental utilities like waters, uh, water sanitization and waste. With, the, no, with taking no much time, I would like to introduce to all of you with our next speaker, Ms. Uh, Katrina, who will be going to talk about uh, the role of women and the challenges which the women are facing in the tourism industry. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I didn't prepare any PowerPoint and uh, I must say, you know, um, at the start, you know, my computer is broken um, and I just asked myself uh, if I were a man, uh, would it be uh, easier to uh, fix my computer? But uh, I think I can make it happen. So I will um, definitely, you know, talk about my experience. Uh, um, maybe um, not as a source of inspiration, but maybe to bring a, a perspective of um, about diversity uh, because uh, you know um, actually I'm not technically Asian I was born in France uh, raised and educated in France but however half of my roots are uh, Asian from Vietnam and they are coming from Asian uh, women you know um, we have my four great great grandmothers were um, Vietnamese four great-grandfathers were uh, French. So they met in Indochina. And uh, for me, uh, I never questioned my life as a woman or, or a man or uh, I didn't, uh, I was kind of gender blind. Uh, so for me, the, it didn't matter. But gradually, uh, especially because I lived 17 years in Korea and I was uh, surrounded by uh, many powerful Korean women, um, Dr. Taleb Rifai know uh, one of them. Uh, I just realized I was uh, educated in some way uh, in a Confucianist way, uh, meaning that uh, women have a position, they need to keep that position. Uh, and of course, they are given some responsibilities, they are given some uh, opportunities, but at the end of the day, they should not compete with men. Uh, so when my brother was born uh, two years after me, uh, I simply disappeared because he was at the center of uh, uh, the, the family. You know, he was uh, in the tower. And also, I would say uh, it also helped me, you know, to be more independent, to um, make decisions for my own life. Uh, it was kind of difficult because nobody cared about me. I mean, I'm just exaggerating. You know, my parents cared about me, mm -hmm. but in some way. Uh, they made me a very independent person. And at the same time, uh, I was gender blind, uh, colorblind, uh, I mean, in a race uh, um, aspect. Um, for me, and I mostly focus on harmony and the similarities between people rather than the differences. And uh, I really wanted to, uh, because we all have uh, our personalities, I really wanted to support people. I was caring about them, maybe too much. Sometimes I was uh, maybe over uh, sensitive, but I was really you know, willing to focus on the, uh, probably the, the, the pain that we all share is that we are all human beings and our life has expiration date. So, uh, that's, uh, that was a little depressing, but at the same time, I said, um, okay, life is a learning experience, and maybe I have a role to play, uh, and maybe these uh, 17 years in Korea uh, have a significance. So when I was appointed uh, recently, 
a little over one year ago, CEO of this nation Mekong, I thought that would be also a great opportunity, you know, to share my experience, maybe to inspire women. And, you know, in um, Asia, we have this concept, uh, I mean, not the whole Asia, but uh, we have this concept of yin and yang. And yin is not negative, uh, and yang is not positive. They are both contributing to the same uh, uh, harmony, you know, uh, we need both, you know, that's, uh, and I can also relate to tourism. Sometimes the Western approach is that uh, this is good, this is bad, uh, mass tourism is bad, uh, niche tourism is good, and um, lecturing, pointing fingers. So my approach is more like uh, women in Asia are so powerful because when you get outside your comfort zone, you expand it. Of course, there is a lot of frustration because women aspire, you know, to have uh, some roles that are still denied to them while they are totally, you know, able to take those roles. And as a woman, I really want to say first, women, don't compete between yourselves. And also women, don't be your own enemy. Because sometimes, you know, we limit ourselves. We believe that, well, um, this is, what life gave me and I need to accept that and I need to, yeah, to get the crumbles and, uh, and let the man, uh, yeah, lead or deal with everything. I would say first, no, uh, I'm not a mother, unfortunately, it's not a choice, but uh, that's uh, my life. Huh? And I would say being a woman is being uh, a mother, sorry, is being an entrepreneur, you know, Women sometimes are multitasking. They are doing so many things at home. Uh, they are taking care, you know, of the finances. They are making uh, big decisions. And this is the case in Korea. You know, Korean women, women stay home. For many of them, when they have a child, they need to raise the child. But at the end of the day, they are the decision makers for big decisions, for education, for traveling, for um, spending for uh, many things. You know, I saw many male colleagues that uh, they get pocket money, but who get the credit card, uh, the wife. Uh, so I would say we need to escape stereotypes. You know, we need to, to also to judge, you know, Asian women um, with the Western eye are saying that poor of them. You know, we are not, I mean, I say we because uh, I feel part now of, uh, uh, I feel Asian women. We are not victims, you know. Uh, the, um, we are victimized sometimes, but we are not victims. We are strong. We are powerful. Uh, we have, you know, this energy of creating and um, the noble roles of also of educating, of being a role model, of taking care of, of a family. And um, sometimes not having children. I believe that uh, being a mother is a fantastic role with a lot of responsibilities. And sorry, gentlemen, sometimes I think some men don't have responsibility at all. You know, they just give the respons responsibility uh, to women, but at the same time, they don't reward them. Uh, women in tourism, sometimes they have very difficult role and also the very great role of making the host happy. You know, we are not talking about uh, tourism, but hospitality. Uh, without women, the travel experience wouldn't be the same. And uh, everything, you know, should be uh, rewarded, uh, valued. We sometimes uh, minimize the value of women, their roles in the society. Uh, and we need to think at the end of the day that it's a hormone um, fate, you know. We were born women because uh, mostly hormones that we have more uh, uh, fem feminine hormones than uh, masculine hormones. But um, we know nowadays that uh, it's not, you know, that easy. It's not gender uh, is man or woman. Now we have so many different, you know, uh, zones that we are exploring. So that it is the same for tourism. So many destinations still not exist. We are exploring new destinations. We are exploring new experiences. So we need to be open-minded enough to believe that women probably are the future of the world. Or if they are not 
alone the future of the world because we still need men, uh, they have their role. Why do we have uh, almost naturally 50% of men and women? It's not because of uh, chance. It's because there must be a reason for that, you know, harmony, it is called. So what I would like to say is, it is also the purpose of uh, Destination Mekong is to champion the Mekong region as an inclusive destination, creating value, impact, and opportunities for all. And I'm not talking only about poor and rich people, but also men and women. And I think at some point, if uh, some women don't feel like they would like to work uh, in this area or other areas, we should give them uh, the opportunity to uh, choose, to make choices for their own life. And taking the model of Korea, I would say education is the basis of everything. Not everything, uh, but education and tourism in some way gives you the opportunity also to learn more about tolerance, more about um, differences and to accept them. Um, so I think um, this is what I'm, the message I wanted to deliver, uh, you know, I always tell people I not consider myself as a feminist. Uh, I take what I deserve and I know that it requires sacrifices, but also the reward is fantastic. So of course, uh, what I would like also to inspire is that, you know, many times in the social media, I can see a lot of, uh, I'm jealous. I envy you, you are so lucky. Uh, not necessary to me, but uh, we need to be more positive, more benevolent. We need to support each other. Otherwise, we will never be able, you know, to learn uh, in this life uh, how to achieve, you know, our life purpose. Uh, it's about climate change also. We will never be able, you know, to adapt to this situation if we focus too much on differences. We need to join hands. Uh, we need also to uh, go further than all those, you know, uh, discrimination, um, also bullying people, minimizing them. This is not human. Uh, we need to be more human to succeed. And I think and I hope uh, the travel industry will serve as a model uh, for other sectors. You know, we have the chance, you know, to, uh, yeah, to bring peace and to uh, promote mutual understanding and tolerance. Uh, so this is the only thing I wanted to say for this webinar. And um, yes, I really admire you, all women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, you. Uh, Ms. Catherine. It is such a wonderful uh, speech you have given. I'm, I'm like, I can feel your positivity, even it is virtual, but still I can feel that positivity in your personality. To be very honest with you, uh, you, you are so true, word to word, it is so true that, you know, this uh, racism or, and when we are talking about the discrimination and all these is somewhere the egos are clashing and we are not treating exactly, we are not considering the rights of uh, women in that way in, in this entire globe. Otherwise, you know, uh, there should be no competition exactly what you said, what you said that there is a competitive feeling in women at times that they started competing with men. And, you know, there are so many points which you uh, bring in notice, which are so true. And if we will be able to implement, that will be really great. And I think uh, the words which you said that should be somewhere in the policy making of tourism as well. Because what you said is actually missing in the tourism policies. There is nothing mentioned like this in the tourism policies. We talk about the equality, giving equal opportunities. We talk about the gender discrimination. We talk about the glass seeding and everything. But we never talk about these points which you have actually, uh, you know, focused right now. Thank you so very much uh, for raising that. these right points with us. So now um, I would like to invite our guest of honor, Professor uh, Jeffrey uh, Lepman. He's with us and he served on public and private sector boards in Africa, Europe, Middle East and Canada. Presently, he is uh, the president. He is the president of Strong Universal Network and he has been appointed. He's been formal president, first president of WTCC and assistant secretary general of UNWTO. 
and today here we going to talk with us about the climate change and uh, tourism so without taking much of the time of everyone i would like to invite you professor lipman for your blissful words because it is always a pleasure to listening to you over to you sir thank you very much and um, good afternoon i guess to everybody out in asia and uh, um, a special hello to my old friend and colleague taleb rifai um, who i spent many happy years with at unwto when he was secretary general there and taleb it's always nice to come on these seminars and see you still so active um as a long time supporter of my friend alessandra alonso's pioneering women in tourism i kind of feel at home in this in this uh, community i'm a believer that we need more leadership from women in tourism that it's a a serious gap I, in in our in our structure and and i um i really empathize with what i've heard already particularly from kathy um but i can add nothing to your to your debate i have no special skills or knowledge in this area what i can do as a tourism climate activist is give you a singular message and it's a message which should resound for for women as well as for men there's no differentiation the climate crisis doesn't actually differentiate between between the sexes we have what the un secretary general has described as a code red climate crisis and it's getting worse uh, we've almost hit our paris 1.5 target and that was that's a 2050 target and we're sitting somewhere at 1.2 to 1.3 degrees of global warming at the moment and we're heading towards 3 to 4 degrees and thinking about your children and my children and grandchildren they won't survive that so we have to do a lot more than we've been doing tourism has a massive exposure in this world we have been based for 100 years on predict frozen jeffrey particularly in the last 10 to 20 years hurricanes floods droughts population migration are intensifying everywhere and if we don't actually act now and go beyond the headline declarations and the the marketing messages produced by consultancies and and advocacy organization we simply won't survive the ipcc the intergovernmental panel on climate change has said that we have to peak our global greenhouse gas emissions by 2025 we have to halve them by 2030 and we have to hit what is being called net zero by 2050 and you will have seen in recent weeks particularly in the run up to cop 27 in egypt all of the tourism organizations have jumped on the 2050 net zero bandwagon and this is not business as usual but it's business almost as usual i haven't seen one organization that has talked about peaking emissions by 2025 as the climate scientists are telling us and we have to do this it's 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 an absolute necessity 
And I want to identify two vehicles that I'm involved with that could help and where we would be delighted to work with the people who are attending this, this seminar um, to help produce a, a better approach to responding to the climate crisis. The first is from Sunex Malta, which is a small NGO that I created as a legacy to Maurice Strong, a friend for 25 years and the father of the global concept of sustainable development, the chair of the first Earth Summit in 1972 and again of the second Earth Summit in 1992, 20 years of of building this framework, which has led us today to the Paris Agreement. And at Sunex Malta, we've developed what we call a climate-friendly travel system, which links Paris 1.5 and SDG 2030 targets. We've created a registry to transparently support company and communities climate and sustainability action plans. Every community is different. Every community has a different culture, as we've heard about Bali today and Uzbekistan. Every community has to develop its own climate and sustainability plans. And we've developed a totally free, there's no cost in, in working with us at Senex Malta, thanks to the support of the government of Malta, um, we've developed a system to help people develop their own climate and, and sustainability plans. And also, we support this with a, a group of trained, graduate, strong climate champions. We've introduced the first diploma in climate-friendly travel, and 80% of our diploma graduates are women. And more than half of these are from the Asia Pacific region. And many are from the least developed countries who are the most exposed to climate disasters. So one of my first message to, to this group today is we are a very small, feisty, uh, Kathy knows this because we've worked with the Mekong group pretty, pretty well over recent years, um, organization which is at no cost helping companies and communities help themselves face their own realities. There is not a global UNWTO or WTTC solution to this challenge. This has got to come from the local level. And we should build on this initiative with communities and companies here in Asia. It's not the only initiative there will not be a magic bullet in this world. It's going to be a, a radical adaptation that we have to take as we see our world changing rapidly around us. And the second initiative I want to mention is the TPCC, the Tourism Panel on Climate Change, which was launched at COP27 a week ago in Sharm El Sheikh. Um, and it's being driven by Daniel Scott from the University of Waterloo in Canada and Susanna Beckham from, from uh, Griffith University in Australia and, and myself. And what we are trying to do is to provide a, a tourism IPCC, something which provides science-based transparent metrics for a tourism Paris 1.5 transformation. It's a, it's a creature that was created by the Sustainable Tourism Global Center in Saudi Arabia. I'm an envoy for that center with a number of other people. And we've gathered more than 60 tourism climate scientists from some 30 countries, including 23 of them who are women, and we're looking for more, and from young women as well. And our plan, after launching in, in the last week, is to have a, a total sector stock take 
around the tourism and climate interface in 2023. And then in 2024, a science assessment of how the sector is meeting the Paris 1.5 targets or failing to meet them. And we think the TPCC will provide an objective basis for policymakers to get us on track for Paris 1.5 for the first time. And I want to again reach out to people in this seminar and to people in the Asia Pacific region. We have a very open mindset about how the TPCC will operate. And we look forward to a good collaboration with women leaders around the world and especially here in Asia. So with those two points, I'd like to thank you for having me here. Um, I know I didn't talk about women issues, but the climate crisis is everybody's issue. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Lefran, that you have accepted our uh, invitation and give us your you know, wonderful time and uh, wonderful knowledge you have given to all of us. And you are very right that climate change is uh, something which is a very big issue all over the globe. And we need to talk about, and I've, in fact, I would like to request Dr. Reza to make a exclusive webinar on this particular topic. It is very much important for all of us. And in fact, in India also, we are facing global warming and there are so many other issues which we are facing. So thank you so very much once again. Now, uh, I would like to invite our next uh, speaker. She is a, st a state civil servant, head of tourism sector in public administration, specialist in the field of law, state language, licensed lawyer, expert on tourism of Kyrgyzstan Republic and Central Asia, manager of international projects on sustainable tourism development, analyst in the field of tourism, law, and media. Graduate students has a number of scientific papers in the field of public policy and management under her. She was awarded honorary diplomas on the, of the Ministry of Culture, Information, Sports and Youth Policy of Kyrgyzstan Republic, Republic, the Ministry of Justice of Kyrgyzstan Republic, the Ministry of Economic and Commerce of the Kyrgyzstan Republic. She is none other than uh, Ms. Kial. She's with us today and I would like to invite you for your great words, please, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Dr. Sharma. I'm happy to be today with you. And hello, Pleasure. dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, and uh, participants of today's webinar. I'm happy to see today uh, 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 Mr. Taleb Rifai, also Jeffrey, dear Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Lipman. Mm, and uh, I want also to thank the organizers for their active efforts uh, to organize this event. Uh, also, uh, I thanks you. I uh, thanks uh, for inviting me as a speaker. Thank you once more. And uh, now I'm uh, pleasantly surprised that here are more people and that here are more. Uh, men and women which want uh, to know more about our tourism sector. Uh, it's a great honor uh, for me to be uh, along with you to represent my country, uh, the Kyrgyz Republic, especially to talk with you about the role of women in Kyrgyz tourism. We all of us know that tourism unites us and brings us closer and it's a great um, okay i will try not to take up a lot of time and immediately to directly uh, to the topic of my speech um, tourism plays an important role in the economic uh, empowerment of women uh, and contributes to the sustainable development of tourism including the development of infrastructure and the richness of uh, not only in our country, but uh, also in the world, I think so. The um, share of women among the 
employed population is highest in the service sector and especially in such activities as real estate uh, transactions, for example, more 90% heals and social services, more than uh, 80% uh, education, more than uh, 80 also, and the uh, tourism sector, hotels and restaurants, more than 80 sector, manufacturing industry, more than 50%. Um, so the role of women in Kazakhstan for development of the economy of our country is very uh, significant. And so let our representatives of the stronger uh, sex not be offended, but the fact is a woman use both uh, hemisphere uh, shares of the brain uh, and uh, to live uh, and work in our country. This allows us to solve several important tasks um, uh, in this uh, rate of kind. Kyrgyz women are known all over the world, uh, not only for their beauty, tenderness, national flower and wisdom, but also uh, for uh, fearlessness, strong wild personality, and of course, hard work. There are many important things to say about the role of women in the development uh, of Kyrgyz tourism. Kyrgyz women choose tourism, uh, which means, uh, and this means uh, the work, raising children, and uh, maintaining a family uh, is a holiday. I think so. Women play a um, uh, main role and the development of the economy of Kazakhstan, and particular the economy of remote areas, rural uh, districts, rural uh, areas. However, she noted that sometimes some traditional and cultural norms make it difficult for women to access a number of public services, access to markets and institutions, social protections, and decent employment opportunities. In this uh, regard, it's important to constantly ensure women's free access to all necessary rights and opportunities because human rights, which are very valuable, then nothing in this life should not be um, in, it, in frame it in any way. She also indicated that in terms of gender, it's important and the Kyrgyz Republic to continue to improve the level of education, economic and other social opportunities for women, including in tourism. How Kyrgyz women work in tourism, um, I will give an example. For, uh, for example, for groups of women work in the village, uh, one group is engaged, engaged in, in the development of tourism in summer, and uh, in winter, uh, works in a, um, for example, uh, maybe in a shop. Uh, the second group is engaged in needle work and sewing, sewing production. Uh, the third is a production of dairy products. And the first is cattle breeding and meat sales, for example. And now we have such uh, kind of works in our, uh, for example, uh, villages. We have a lot of such examples. If desired and supported, you can create jobs at home, stay at home with uh, your family, with uh, his, uh, their family, and develop the area. This is a very important and uh, significant effect of tourism. There are many different uh, opportunities for this uh, in Kyrgyzstan, and slowly the sustainable development of tourism in the region is gaining uh, momentum. Uh, finally, let me boast a little. You can also give me examples as a woman who has been uh, fighting for uh, her self-development all her life and contributes to her country. 
uh, not only here own, but also in the space of Central Asia for the developing, uh, developing of uh, tourism. How we all need to constantly understand that we need to study, contact, uh, contact business, contact politics, develop the country, develop uh, the tourism, uh, sustainable tourism. Without this, uh, it's impossible to move forward. Uh, for in a way. Soon uh, we will, uh, even, sorry, uh, in our country, soon we will organize an international event for the official opening of the winter tourism season. This is uh, only um, in, in the space of Central Asia. The Central Asia, this is uh, such kind of uh, necessary and uh, uh, interesting event. And in the new year, we have a lot of uh, interesting and important tourist events of international importance for the sustainable development of tourism. And taking this opportunity, uh, I invite you to visit Kyrgyzstan, all of you, uh, the land of nomads and the land of uh, tourism. Uh, therefore, uh, please uh, join us. Let's study together. Let's make uh, tourism together. Let's uh, develop sustainable tourism and uh, preserve along with the development of tourism, the ecology also of our planet Earth. Thank you very much. I'm with you. Kyrgyzstan and Kyrgyzstan with you. And Kyrgyzstan want to develop the sustainable tourism um, in the space of Central Asia, also in the space of uh, a big region, our region. And uh, I'm happy to be with you mm -hmm. today. And uh, I hope that we can collaborate uh, in future. And uh, I'm very happy that I meet uh, today uh, in a big um, space of uh, tourism prof professionals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kyal. It is a wonderful speech, I must say. And thank you so much for inviting all of us and appreciating our efforts. It's really very heart touching, actually. And in fact, I'm working uh, with uh, lots of persons uh, from Kyrgyzstan. And uh, I would like to also tell you that uh, uh, I virtually actually met uh, many of your students, especially girls, young girl students, and they are very active. They are very keen to learn. I mean, they are very good learners actually and um, i had an opportunity to meet them virtually for one week and have one week we had some classes and exchange of information on tourism and hotel management and other and even management and i must say that the students of kyrgyzstan especially the girls are very active they are very quick learners and they are very focused they are so i really appreciate and in fact i'm also working on a book on central asia tourism uh, with uh, one of uh, professor from uh, Kyrgyzstan, Dr. Azmat. So uh, I would also like to invite you to contribute for that book in any ways, if you will be able to, that would be a pleasure for me too. Thank you so very much for giving your time. Thanks a lot. So now moving towards our next speaker, Dr. Pratibhani Bandusena. She is a lecturer at University of uh, Moratwa in Sri Lanka. So see, uh, today in the webinar, we have the eminent speakers from Uzbekistan, from Kyrgyzstan, from Sri Lanka, from Nepal, from Bali, from Indonesia, and of course, a moderator from India also. So now we have our next speaker from Sri Lanka. She is a visiting lecturer of the Master of Tourism, Economics and Hotel Management, Department of Economics, University of Kuala Lumpur, Sri Lanka. She is a visiting lecturer of the Executive Diploma in Tourism, Event and Hospitality Management Institute of Human Resource Advancement, University of Kuala Lumpur. She is a joint secretary member of the International Research Symposium on Biodiversity and Sustainable Tourism, which is organized by the Ministry of Environmental and the Tourism Study Program. Of Department of Economics, University of Colombo. Dr. Pratibhani is, has invite, uh, been invited in many national and international conferences and seminars as a panel member, as a guest speaker, and she has a vast experience as of teaching as well as of training 
to the students of hotel e hotel management even management and tourism i would like to invite you dr pratibhani for your presentation please thank you am i audible yeah you are audible yeah uh, thank you very much for the um, actually excellent uh, direction okay okay uh, actually uh, moderator associate professor anukriti sharma sharma and all speakers all delegates uh, and all participants uh, first of all i would like to give my gratitude to professor anukriti sharma to give me this excellent opportunity uh, i'm going to tell you uh, situation of sri lankan women in tourism i hope uh, you all maybe some of them already visited to sri lanka uh, if we take uh, sri lanka uh, you all know pearl of the indian ocean and uh, tourists they can uh, gain diverse experience within the island uh, from uh, north to south east to west uh, so we have uh, eco tourism coastal tourism my tourism and uh, there are a lot of historical places so uh, actually sri lanka provide diverse uh, activities for tourists so uh, if we take at glance uh, tourism in sri lanka uh, so in 2018 4.9 uh, gdp contribution uh, but uh, after after the uh, 2019 and 20 these uh, values are highly fluctuated uh, because of uh, different uh, forces actually uh, tourism industry highly sensitive and at the same time uh, uh, sri lanka already faced a lot of uh, internal and external forces in 2019 east attack and at, and after that uh, covid uh, 19 pandemic and at the same time uh, mid of 2021 um, economic crisis so uh, because of that these values are fluctuated uh, so in 2019 uh, 4.3 uh, gdp contributed uh, from tourism and 1.9 million uh, tourists are arrived in 2020 only 0.5 million tourists are arrived so uh, if we take a uh, woman role in sri lanka uh, so uh, here you can see uh, at glance uh, part, uh, labor force participation rate uh, sri lanka male uh, around 70% and female around 30% so if we take percentage uh, percentage distribution of working age population by economic status and gender so you can see uh, around 68% economically inactive uh, female uh, and in addition to that when compared with a male um, so a contribution family work uh, when compared with male 4.4% uh, they contribute to family workers and at the same time uh, in sri lanka female economically inactive uh, 70% and as well as if we take the uh, uh, sector wise uh, so high per percentage of female are contribute in a uh, state sector and uh, around 30% 34% in urban and uh, 33% in rural sector so if we take women role in tourism uh, in sri lanka uh, so women participate executive level to uh, grounded uh, downward uh, so in addition to that uh, most of them are working in the informal sector uh, so but however in sri lanka uh, managerial and executive uh, level in tourism less participation in women and mostly in service uh, supply sector Uh, when we consider about the uh, sector wise rural sector women participation is high so uh, if we take uh, if we uh, explain further challenges more specifically to sri lanka i hope that you already know uh, sri lanka has uh, multi 
uh, ethnic and multi-ethnic. Uh, multi so therefore, uh, we have different social attitudes. Uh, so uh, most of the uh, society, they have wrong opinion in tourism and as well as uh, because of that lack of interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, women, they are not ready to take challenges. And uh, so as well as the community per perceptions, they, they are think that the working in the tourism hospitality is not a safe. So if we take the culture uh, in Sri Lanka, we have again, uh, multi-ethnic. Uh, uh, so because of that, uh, we have different beliefs, uh, most Buddhist, in addition to that, uh, Tamil, Hindu, um, Christian, Catholic, Burger, so multi-ethnic uh, population living. So because of that, um, the community, based on their beliefs, sometimes uh, they are reluctant to wear the dress code and as well as uh, they have different cultural value and their, uh, their activity is different. So because of that also, uh, the most uh, women, they're reluctant to engage in tourism sector and as well as high uncertainty. Uh, as I uh, told you at the beginning, Sri, uh, Sri Lanka, we exposed uh, different internal and uh, external shocks uh, because of the attack and the COVID pandemic, and at the same time, uh, political uh, unstable and the economic crisis. So because of that, uh, the dropout rate goes high. And in addition to that, most of the informal sector, uh, popular uh, women, they are switching to different uh, job categories. Uh, for example, so they are uh, going abroad as housemaid, uh, and in addition to that, um, they uh, give up their career. So like that, uh, because of high, high uncertainty, they're reluctant to work in tourism industry and a lack of facilities. Uh, because uh, in, I, I think uh, we all be aware that uh, women, they are really, uh, they have to a lot of uh, works in the house within their home. Uh, so because of that, uh, un irregular working hours and uh, they are suffering from, they have problem of transport facilities and daycare facilities. Um, so that is also one of the challenge we have. And at the same time, uh, family com commitment, um, so because uh, as a mother and as a wife, a uh, woman has a uh, lot of duties to fulfill. Uh, and at the same time, uh, most uh, of them are, early, some of them are early marriage. So because of that, uh, they give up their career. Uh, so according to the World Bank study on women participation in the Sri Lanka labor force, 85% uh, of the response uh, stated that women are lucky to leave their job in tourism after uh, marriage. So, and at the same time, uh, lack of uh, information and knowledge and experience, uh, because uh, most of the rural areas, uh, women, they not exposed. Uh, so therefore they don't have uh, good knowledge, sound knowledge to uh, develop uh, their uh, career. And at the same time, sometimes if they are doing some kind of uh, small business, how to develop, so that kind of uh, problems uh, within the community. So that is also one of the challenge and lack of mentors and role models. In Sri Lanka, uh, there are less number of uh, executive level in the tourism. So because of that, uh, we don't, there are few. Uh, because of that, uh, they don't have a mentor or role models to develop their career and a tourism education from secondary or high school. In Sri Lanka, uh, tourism education started in tertiary level. So because of that, uh, uh, students, they, they don't have a sound idea about what is the industry and at the same time, what is a uh, female role. Uh, in addition to that, after passed out, uh, after entering to the tertiary level, they start uh, their, their this, uh, tourism career. 
So that is also one of the challenge. And at the same time in Sri Lanka, only few state universities, they are offering undergraduate degree programs. So we have a masters, but uh, only few state. And at the same time, in addition to that, there are a few private universities also, uh, but it's in, uh, inadequate. So uh, if we talk about way forward in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, women in tourism. So uh, we urgently, we need the perception change. So according to the PBW survey highlighted that attitude change of the accommodation sector, 40% uh, or 45% required and uh, to operation and travel guide 67 and my tourism sector 53. Uh, so because uh, we require to change their perfect perception and at the same time uh, develop their interpersonal skills, self-confidence, self-esteem, hard working. So we require to develop uh, their qualities um, and as well as network building uh, because, uh, because of highly uncertainty, uh, they, uh, they feel unsafer. So if, if, they, if uh, we can develop uh, networking, then, and at the same time, especially for entrepreneurs um, in national and as well as international level networking. So then they can develop their uh, career. And at the same time, uh, capacity building. So uh, cap if we take the uh, capacity building, uh, Actually, uh, that uh, PWC gap analysis uh, highlighted that the accommodation sector, 78% uh, to operator and travel guide sector, 72% and my tourism, 64% uh, soft skill development needed. And as well as uh, accommodation sector, 58%, my tourism sector, 28%, technical skill uh, development required. Uh, so, and in addition to that, uh, formalized, uh, maybe especially in the uh, city level, uh, we can uh, initiate CBOs, community-based organizations, uh, to uh, develop their skills and as well as um, uh, show their market and open up their uh, business into the uh, international level and make the standards and as well as uh, registration procedures. Um, in addition to that, uh, standard facilities, uh, especially daycare facilities, transport facilities, changing rooms, uh, so like that, and uh, <clears throat> developing partnerships uh, and as well as uh, national policies. In Sri Lanka, uh, actually needed uh, national policies uh, more oriented to the career development uh, and, uh, and at the same time, um, uh, career development and uh, laws, uh, especially special reference to women. Uh, so like that, uh, we require some kind of national policies to uh, uplift uh, the more, uh, increase the woman contribution. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, empirical studies related to the woman in tourism lacking. So therefore uh, we require further research studies uh, related to the innovations and code of ethics and best practices we required. Uh, actually in Sri Lanka, um, we have uh, different uh, institutions and universities, some organizations, they are doing different projects, research and studies. But in Sri Lanka, we don't have kind of uh, one platform, one unit uh, for uh, more specific to the uh, women in tourism, Sri Lanka. So because of that, actually, uh, I would uh, invite you all to, there's an opportunity to uh, do collaborative research studies and capacity development. Uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, I think uh, this webinar, not uh, uh, we can make this webinar not a one single uh, session. So this is, uh, we can convert as a beginning to uh, share our thoughts and experience and best practices uh, to uh, grab the uh, actual grounded needed and as well as to, to overcome these uh, empirical gaps. Um, so therefore, uh, 
I would like to invite you all to uh, extend your research studies more orient to the uh, Sri Lankan women in tourism and as well as uh, we can get together and establish kind of a, uh, one stage to uh, discuss this uh, in further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pratibhani. Indeed, this is a wonderful presentation and uh, because I have been to Sri Lanka twice and I know that uh, Sri Lankan women, they are very good. They are really very good hosts. They are very good dancers. They are very good, uh, you know, they are, uh, they are beauty with brain, actually. I must say that, um, like uh, Mr. Kyal also said from Kyrgyzstan that we need to join hands. Now you are also saying the same thing. So I think we women can do something actually with the help of uh, men like uh, Dr. Reza that we can make some forum or maybe some uh, platform mm -hmm. again and join hands to make some you know practical training session for the women, especially in the rural areas. If it is not possible through virtually, then maybe in an offline mode in person to person in face to face way. But yes, there is a requirement. In fact, India is also a country of villages and maximum of mm. rural ladies and females, they are working in tourism area, but they have no as such, you know, links, uh, how to demonstrate their skills, how to market their products. So, of course, these are the requirements if you really want to promote uh, more uh, you know fuel centric tourism in our countries thank you so very much to be with us thank you so moving towards the next speaker before i'll move towards the next speaker i, I have to request all of you that we are you know lack in time we are short in time now so please uh, make your presentation for five to maximum seven minutes not more than this please it's a humble request though we are really excited and want to uh, listen to all of you but as dr pratibhani also said that in one session it is not at all possible to cover so many diverse topic we will definitely organize once again a webinar maybe one or two three series of uh, on the same topic but not at this time please so it is a humble request again that don't extend the presentation more than five to seven minutes and now i would like to invite uh, dr uh, my uh, nuen from uh, uh, she is a lecturer in marketing in the uh, UK, business, UQ Business School at the University of Queensland, Australia. Her research interests include pro-environmental behavior change, knowledge sharing, innovative technologies, food choice and food waste. This is so wonderful. And I have just checked the chat box as well. She have already sent some project link over there. Kindly see that link because she invited all of us to join that particular project. It is on food waste, something like that. So please try to see that link in the chat box. She has published her research in Journal of Business uh, Research, British Journal of Management, Journal of Knowledge Management, and Journal of Retailing and Consumer Services, among others. And she is having a very big profile. So, But I'm not taking much of the time of uh, all the listeners. We are waiting to listen to you, Professor Nguyen, please. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me today. So I'm sure I'm sharing my slide. I'm not sure. Do you see it? Yeah, it's visible. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you very much for having me today. So I made it very short because like um, the time is um, really kind of, we run out of the time. So first, let me be going to the food choice and food grid and then the roles um, of the woman in the, you know, contributing to the sustainability. I would love to introduce the grid, uh, you know, team where I'm working in. So I belong to the Low Harm Indonesia Initiative led by Professor Sarah Donichas. Uh, you can see like here's the picture of our team where you can see so many women are included in our team. Uh, so we are led by Professor Sarah Sardonichas is really the person who inspires women who do their, you know, research, the best research to do like to protect our planet and try to drive pro environmental behavior changes. So we work hard to develop and test uh, the new theories and try to see which way we can do to bring to the practical the practices to reduce the, you know, like carbon emission to, to hazard, you know, like mitigate uh, global warm, warming or maybe climate changes. 
Um, so when we talked about the research, we probably seen so many people, especially women, have some you know limited opportunities because of you know like commitment, family commitments. We got a different situations. But if you need any help, if you want to have collaboration, um, our team really the group of people who really inspire women, especially women, to do research and quality research. We have provided so many, you know, mm -hmm. webinars and seminars and training, provide mentorship for the early career researchers to, 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 to empower especially women in their careers. So here's the two examples. I just make it very short because we run out of time. But for example, like that Sarah Dunich has created, the, you know, like Woman Voice in Tourism Research, where we have the book to, to see what is the woman, you know, generation have done in this current, you know, generation and what we should do in the future generation as well. And then in the... <clears throat> Uh, I mean, like in February <laughs> next year, Sarah Dunich has also want to provide as a mentorship or maybe the webinars where we can provide, where she can provide advice and some, some kind of tip and some kind of thing to have, the, you know, emerging scholar researchers who think they cannot, you know, be seen, who they see that their research haven't been supported. You can come to join the seminar where Sarah Dunich is the co-editor of the Arnold's Tourism Research, going with other three co-auditors of journals of travel research and the tourism management. So three, these three wonderful women are going to have you guys to see, see whether we can help you with your research. I go to match with everything information background with my team. Now I go focus on the projects and where I'm going, I'm working on it. So basically I'm focused on the plate wet to where you can see it's a really big issue, not just in uh, everywhere, also in uh, Asian country as well. And uh, every year we can see more than 10% of the foot on plates uh, is wetted. It is really huge burden in terms of the financial, uh, you know, like economic philosophy for each country. And globally we lose $300 billion per year. And it contributes to the 2.5% increase, increase to the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which is really extremely high numbers. So as uh, before, we have Professor Liman's uh, emphasis that we need to do now, otherwise our uh, take action from now, otherwise our future generation, our kids, our children in the future probably have to you know, suffer a lot from the global warming or maybe the climate changes. So uh, Professor Sarah has already conducted a research in 2019 to figure out what, the, what are the drivers mm -hmm. plate waste. She conducted uh, the interview with the different stakeholders, especially staff in ho hotel buffet to see what is the main reason why the travel people who travel to the you know like different places left a lot of food waste in the uh, in the restaurants. A white buffet, white hotel buffet, because in this setting, we usually think about we pay a certain amount of money and then you can eat as much as possible. So you don't need to pay HR money if you like more food on the table. So that can, that's contact, he do this some contact probably, uh, maybe like the reason why people have meant, you know, like reason to, to put food on the, you know, wasted. So she found out that uh, some main reason contribute to the, um, you know, a driver of the plate waste. One of them is about food quality, where we see some, you know, cheap ingredients and make the food probably not really tasty as it should be. Or maybe it's about the lack of food or related expertise, where usually tourists uh, travel to some traveling destination. Uh, they don't know what the food of the locals, you know, food, uh, well, they want to take the authentic taste of the local food as well, but they don't know how to combine them together. And maybe the wrong combination can cause some maybe like not tasty foods then they left food on the table. We also have the lack of famil familiarity of the food as well in the traveling destination as well, which also lead to the, you know, like you want to taste a good food, an authentic food, local food, but you are not familiar with the food as well. So probably that is uh, the main reason the plate works. Uh, also about the unconscious over serving as well, where you think you can eat more, but actually you cannot. 
and the fear of missing out where you think if you don't grab a lot of food, probably the food disappear. So that kind of the control of the behavior, whether you can control your behavior to stop, you know, like putting more food on your plate. And maybe also another reason which probably surprised you is about laziness, where tourists probably don't want to stand up around many times, go back to, to take more food. They just want to, you know, put more food on the plate and then they just sit and then enjoy their meals. So those kind of the reason contribute to plate weight at all, you know, like in restaurants. And food waste in the restaurant have to go to the landfills. And in the picture, it's really kind of thing you need to, you know, think about that. Probably just one person have some food left on the plate, but think about in the global scale and then how we need to deal with all, all of those, you know, consequences of plate waste in general. So in uh, we will have to you know do so many kind of systematic literature review to see how many intervention have been done to reduce plate waste, and then uh, usually we need to take uh, some actions right because we see so many food plates uh, wasted in the restaurants. So many people, many practical practitioner, many you know, researchers try to find what should we do, and usually they just have the message uh, in the restaurant try to not customer to, hey, please reduce plate weight. But probably it doesn't work well because when, you know, customer go to a restaurant, they want to enjoy their meal rather than, you know, focusing on the message or in some way in the restaurants. Uh, maybe some restaurant also try to charge more money for the food waiters, but probably influence the customer satisfaction with the restaurant and then probably they don't want to go back to the restaurant. So because of the restaurant doesn't want to lose the customer satisfaction, also seek, uh, you know, food still waiting in the restaurant. So what is the solution for everything is for the food wet and plate wet in restaurants. So in 2022, Sarah Donicha has already conducted an intervention and she, she found that enjoyment is the key for the intervention for any practitioner to reduce plate weight in the restaurant in the, in the traveling you know, destination. So she found that so she designed for the gay intervention game where she um, uh, gave incentive for the families in the hotel buffet. If they finish the food waited on the table, they can have, you know, like a sticker as a, you know, like a, an incentive. And for the family, usually kids really want to have a sticker. They finish their food. They even ask the parents to finish their food to get, you know, the sticker. And at the end of the intervention, we, we had the food waste reduce up to by 34%, which is really great uh, you know, achievement. And the hotel expenses were reduced significantly. Uh, importantly, yes, satisfaction wasn't in, yeah, you know, affected by the intervention. So this uh, kind of intervention motivated me to contribute as a woman. So I think a woman can do a lot to contribute to sustainability. Uh, I think that this uh, you know, kind of intervention, really great thing, great idea. But just because it has some limitation, because they just limit to the family segments, which is small <laughs> there. Segments. I want to, you know, like open the segment and then leverage the game-based intervention using technologies and to design the game. We can integrate more gas, uh, customer in restaurants. Want to have the social game. Want to have social, you know, like uh, competition and social, you know, like cooperation as well. So I'm I'm doing the projects where I myself design the game-based intervention, but I really need your help, guys. I especially women who think you have, you know, were in, incorrect in any other aspect. But in my projects, you are really welcome to contribute. Uh, any change that make a lot of difference. And in any individual who make change, it also make the global, you know, the differences. Uh, any support from you also really counts for my projects, you know, like even you just need to advise me how to design the game, even you just need to uh, advise me how to refine the game where I can bring them to intervention. Uh, or maybe you can have, you know, as a place, you know, the restaurant where I, I can do like implement, implement some of my, uh, you know, intervention into your restaurant. Or you have the connection to where you can help me to connect with restaurants to implement my game intervention as well. Any helps count. Um, and then at the end of my project, I'm going to uh, provide open as the handbook guide to where I can tell you 
uh, any provider, food provider, what is the effective way to have, you know, to re reduce place weight in the traveling destinations? And it's really it's kind of like open as that for anyone who, who wish to reduce place weight, it's the open, easy for you guys. Uh, and then um, I need your help, and especially the timely, you know, support really important because I need to submit the application for my project in 21st of November. So if you can write the support letter for me before that time, it's really important. And then I have the link already in the chat box. I also have the QR code if you, for your convenience to, you know, to scan it and then think about that. The template already provided, you just need to, you know, modify the text. Any support I already mentioned, any support really count. Even you just need to, you know, like want to just uh, advise me what to, how to design the game or how to refine the game. Any connection really, you know, important for me. My email already in the uh, link. Uh, if you wish to contact me separately, so feel free to do that. And then if you want to connect with me in what? my Instagram, in my Twitter, in my LinkedIn, every link is already provided in the link. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And I must say it is a very holistic thing which you are and your team uh, is doing. And it is indeed, again, very much required. I really appreciate it. And I would like to request each and every one to support this uh, particular project and uh, I will personally also going to discuss about uh, this particular project in line and lands with you. Thank you so very much for your valuable time and wonderful presentation. So now we are having our next speaker. She is a very young girl and um, she is uh, currently working as a customer support representative, has the ability to lead members in an NGO. She co-founded Women in Tourism Indonesia handled more than 20 plus trainings and projects with uh, projects with three years experience. To support her interest in people and development, she is now pursuing a master degree in psychology with an industrial and organizational specialty. She is none other than uh, Ms. Monica, co-founder and director of Women in Tourism Indonesia. I would like to welcome you, Monica, for your presentation, please. Okay, good evening for everyone. Good evening for Mr. Taleb. Thanks so much for Mem Anukrati uh, for the opportunity. Uh, okay, everyone, my name is uh, Monica. I'd like to present on behalf of our organization, which is Women in Tourism Indonesia. So this is an overview of our organization. Uh, we hold a vision to promote gender equality. Uh, this is in consonance with SDGs, I believe, and inspired to raise public awareness about the importance of women participation in Indonesia's tourism sector. Aside from that, uh, there's an urge uh, for us to encourage our women to share, connect, and network to improve their skill, because we believe that our voice will uh, be heard stronger when we can collaborate together. And of course, uh, we foster innovative creation, promoting inclusive development and, uh, and economic growth of Indonesian women in the tourism industry. Okay, this is a little background from us. We've known gender equality uh, is viewed as one of the important SDGs by the United Nations, but in Indonesia itself, 55% of tourism workforce are dominated by women. I know it's great if we, uh, uh, if we are talking about numbers, but of course, uh, again, we cannot be glad instantly if we uh, still face inequalities uh, such as weight gap. In fact, 30% uh, women paid less than men. Uh, there are also other inequalities like subordinate, subordination, marginalization, and discrimination that affect women in tourism Indonesia. Before we feel about the varieties of issues uh, in women in tourism, I'll deliver about the three main issues about gender in tourism. I stated this from uh, Margaret, Margaret Swain in 1995. Well, tourism is constructed from gendered societies. Uh, there is complexity as the product of tourism itself is service and it is intangible. So there are also interdependency between guests uh, and hosts or tourists and employee. And the second one, uh, it is also engaged that tourism has a high multiplier effect that's interconnected to gender relations in social, economic, culture, and politics. And the third one, lastly, it's about power, control that are articulated through race, class, and gender relations. 
So based on that, uh, we see the bigger picture. Uh, this is when we try to, uh, what is it, to elaborate what are the issues we face for women in tourism and why so many and from bottom to the top, uh, from, from bottom to the surface, we can see uh, it, it from the iceberg theory. And, and the surface and the surface we can see weights and uh, job security, double burden, stereotypes, and subordinate, access to education and skills, uh, and job access and unpaid work. And then for the core it is, we can see that uh, gender-based violence, uh, woman trafficking, and Power, feel, uh, power relation and violence. And what is actually gender mainstreaming policy in, in Indonesia tourism sector? Of course, uh, in Indonesia, we have Riparnas. What is Riparnas actually? This is the long-term tourism policy in the 28th uh, chapter, but it's unfortunate that this uh, doesn't work well yet. We even talked uh, to our associates a while ago from our webinars and the event that we held uh, from Women in Tourism and they don't feel safe, equal, empowered yet. So it's not, uh, so, uh, it is not uh, still not implemented uh, properly in accountable programs. And then um, in Indonesia, the research on gender issues in tourism is still very limited. Although in empirical ways, we still a lot of problems, a lot of issues. And in fact, uh, only 22.5% uh, research in Indonesia discuss about women or gender equalities in tourism. Up until now, unfortunately, there is still no official data released quantitatively regarding the number of sexual violence and gender-based violence victims in the Indonesian tourism sector. So in this year, we published a research about sexual violence in the Indonesian tourism workplace, and the results shows there is a, a very complexity of the dimension of power relation that affect it. Okay, so this is the elaboration of this research. From that research, we learned, we learned that customer satisfaction aspect creates a stigma from society toward women tourism worker. This stigma is uh, created from the assumption that tourism worker must do whatever it takes to make customers satisfied. From the figure, there is a higher power is collected by the guests and it is interconnected with the house. So from the connection, it then created a power dependent relation that can produce inequality because of the customer satisfaction and the power relation or a push of power uh, based on the inequality itself. Uh, this can be from the tourists or house, and, uh, and this can be from the managerial position who are in the higher position. So in fact, uh, from the inter interviews we made, we uh, the foreign work and tourism sector are still to know uh, that what happened to them and was a problem at that time. So uh, what does it matter? And we do need to, of course, uh, to break these inequalities. We see that we need education, so our hard uh, skills training, entrepreneurial skills to break the issues. And besides, there is still a lack of research. Only 0.3% university uh, uh, and tourism institution in Indonesia put gender and tourism as their subjects. And also lack of women in tourism networking uh, and no platform that provide training for women tourism SP, uh, SMEs uh, uh, for, for the first time. And then uh, we see there are all always uh, key learning we can adapt from our CCs, okay? So there, there are problems, of course, and. Uh, we also provide solutions and like uh, we have um, discussed from uh, from our from our associates uh, she is Gandhi Gandhi is from Bali she is the leader of Cyan tourism village uh, she, she said that she believes she can do it and all other women to be in the management level by boosting their confidence and give them equal permission and also we uh, we have uh, Alfonso Horeng she is the leader of women refer that said uh, Flores women uh, have a tough character because they live directly side by side by the nature and that this is with what gives women strength to empower them by having tenacity, discipline, and perseverance. Of course, to enhance the participation of women in tourism, there are several ways we can, uh, we, we, uh, we can, uh, we can tackle together. First one, women need to acquire at least course basic business skills such as bookkeeping, marketing, and speaking English. And also uh, from, the, from Gandhi's experience, we see that encouraging the participation of female graduates in tourism studies puts a lot of 
uh, benefit for you to be uh, to be back and contribute to their villages. And of course, training and development of niche markets, expand and diversify trade for their tourism products and services uh, through digital technologies. And uh, lastly, facilitates women's voice in the community and household is also important because it will make uh, them to create a safe space as well as uh, for, uh, for networking um, net management for them. And yeah, so I'd like to highlight one of our program, uh, which is Women in Tourism Indonesia Camp. This is an intensive training we held last year. Uh, the curriculum is crafted based on the issues mentioned in the Global Report on Women in Tourism uh, published by the UN WTO in 2019 and ASEAN Gender and Development Tourism Favorable Work Plan. And there are five classes that we talk in this program, uh, which were project in community-based tourism, network in tourism, gender bias in tourism sector, response to sexual harassment, and gender mainstreaming in marketing tourism sector. And this program was supported by some of the NGOs in Indonesia, such as Conservation International, UN Women, and Australia Awards. And for the aforementioned objective, we observed that gender issues should be considered when educating for effective curriculum in both universities and vocational studies. We believe that this program is great to increase the competitiveness of youth female leaders, improving their employability in the tourism industry in the future that they may take. Also, we have high hopes for all female leaders that are participating in Women in Tourism Indonesia camp to take initiative in the social system within the tourism industry in the future. And in a brief of our program, we found out that 93% uh, of social and tourism students and fresh graduates that have interest in the tourism study understand and able to implement leadership and gender awareness after participating uh, uh, this program. And also, women in tourism Indonesia classes and activity uh, out of uh, active 5% uh, participants asp aspire to be leaders in the tourism industry after followed uh, women in tourism Indonesia uh, camp classes and activities. And uh, okay, so um, women in tourism in Asia, uh, because we are here to aspire to promote gender equality, to raise public awareness about the importance of women participation. We also associate with other women from 15 countries and talk about the challenges, issues, and opportunities for our tourism sector continuously. And I know that uh, from our previous program, from our previous webinars, uh, through digitally and physically, uh, it is a stage of empowerment. And we also we we always believe that empowerment is a process. Hold the vision, trust the process, and again, sorry. and again. Uh, we won't stop by easily. We are about to achieve gender justice, based transformation of education, research, and practice. So thank you for your opportunity. Uh, I wish uh, we can connect together and uh, feel free to read me uh, out uh, through LinkedIn, uh, email, website. Thank you. This is so wonderful, Monica. I must say in such a young age, you have such uh, tremendous work and so right observations. I, I really appreciate it. And in fact, I would like to contact you further after the webinar. And I would like my students will be going to, you know, I'm very hopeful for this, that my students definitely will going to associate with you for this particular, uh, you know, project. So we'll discuss about it later on. Yes, by of the course. Way, Thank but you. it is really appreciable. Good job. Keep going. Keep shining. So now we have, after this young girl, after her presentation, now we have a very senior professor with us, Professor uh, Nargis uh, Nur, uh, Nurula. She is uh, a professor from uh, Arts Department from Samarkand Silk, Samarkand State University, Silk Road Tourism, Uzbekistan. And uh, she is an expert on gender issues. And she has a couple of books on gender issues as well as her own culture in Central Asia. And today she will be going to talk about women of Uzbekistan and I think Hajj. Uh, I would like to invite you, Professor Nargis, for your speech, please. You, you are muted. Uh, please unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, first of all, 
get uh, so many fascinating, interesting presentations. The separate thanks to our facilitator, Dr. Anukarti Sharma. Very good interpretation and comments for each speaker. Thank you. Thank you. My presentation is sort of continuation of the focus of our webinar on the Central Asian region. Everybody knows that tourism has been viewed as an engine for women's economic environment. In, and probably in all countries that we already had presentation from, and in Uzbekistan as well, it's not an exception. Uh, um, it, it has more women in economic environment than probably in other sectors. And Mastura, my colleague from Samarkand University in her presentation, verified this view and made my work easier. I want to talk about religion and two ways and about Hajj. I will talk about Hajj a bit later, but let me first say that religion and tourism are two pronounced aspects of contemporary civilization, although they have an entirely different context. Um, only few probably experts would probably admit that certain similarities exist between religion and tourism. The extent the large number of participants, of course, and their significance in human life. In contemporary complex world, religion not only survive, but also are gaining in strength and influence. Here, I would like to start with the two major aspects of the proposed topic. In the context of the discussion about gender, it's reasonable to mention, of course, the UN World Tourism Organization, separate compliments to Talib Rifai. As a UN institution, it has developed a program with a broad and modern women's empowerment principles in tourism. The program has served as a platform for gender inclusive work in all spheres of tourism in Uzbekistan. The main institution in Uzbekistan working with a UN World Tourism Organization is a Silk Road Office. It's a unitary enterprise. Uh, or it's Uzbek IPAC Yuli Office. In 2021, for example, close to 200 private companies in Uzbekistan had committed to the UN World Tourism Organization and its gender principles. However, there is still many opportunities for companies to strengthen gender mainstreaming in their operations. Those opportunities should be less probably concerning perpetuating the colonial myth of singular, exceptional, and superior civilization. Perhaps we need a more holistic approach to advancing the rights and freedoms of women, not just in Central Asia, of course. And because gender empowerment cannot work without giving the primary role to local voices. In the context of today's topic, would be right to refer on Leila Ahmed, her book, Woman and Gender in Islam, Historical Roots of a Modern Debate. The research explained the use of women in the colonial project. Quote, the idea that man is in colonized societies beyond the borders of the civilized West oppressed woman. It was to be used in a rhetoric of colonialism, end of quote. It is clear enough that gender and woman are the major topic among others linked to Islam today. We live in a paradoxical world where Islam is both loved and hated, but he is not a call to get back to romanticized vision of ethnic past, but a critical extraction and refinement of the Islamic and local cultural resources in light of global realities. In many Central Asian, I think um, very many Central Asian Islamic scholars pointed out that Quran clearly instates the principle of equality among all humans. It means that alternative, not patriarchal interpretation of the Quran do exist. Therefore, the topic puts women's involvement in tourism in the foreground and looks uh, at how Islam and local culture specifics are affecting the direction of development of this sector. Traveling for religious motivation is probably the oldest and most widespread form of travel in human history. 
and the topic woman in Uzbekistan, in Uzbekistan and Hajj is more about the intersection of tourism and religion, spirituality and pilgrimage. It can illuminate many topics of interest to the social sciences, as well as important form of, from a policy and industry viewpoint. Every year, almost 300 million Muslims visit Mecca to perform Hajj or Umrah. Hajj is the pilgrimage that every able Muslim can perform once in a lifetime, and Umrah is the minor pilgrimage. Both are not compulsory, by the way. Very recently, we've been informed that the president of Uzbekistan and the minister of Hajj and Umrah of Saudi Arabia at the talks in Tashkent in September this year, reached an agreement to increase the quota for citizens of Uzbekistan to perform the Hajj up to 24,000 and Umrah up to 100,000. It means that slightly less than 50% of those numbers will be women. Most local women of Central Asia seek to behave in accordance with the teaching of Islam and understanding the religion is important to them. <laughs> I think Hajj can be used to provide men and women with the tools to advocate gender equality in Islam and through Islamic local culture. Because Hajj and Umrah as a religious activity both demonstrate the purpose of religion to religious tourism, learning and seeking knowledge. <coughs> Sorry, it is unreasonable, therefore, to consider Islam as being against tourism. All Islamic principles urge people to travel and see other nations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor <coughs> Nargis. And uh, I can see that uh, in spite of your you know, health issues and so thought, you have given a wonderful presentation and I think you are very much right to a certain extent. And um, in fact, uh, I'm in very much contact with the, uh, with the academicians from Uzbekistan, Turkey, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and even Turkestan. So, and uh, I somehow also experienced the same thing. I have visited Uzbek once, thrice Turkey. So, you know, I also realized a few points which you have raised here are very true actually. So thank you so much for, to be with us today. And uh, moving towards the next speaker, she is from uh, Nepal. Ms. Uh, Bhadel is a founding president of Girls Empowerment by Travel Nepal. And uh, she's a graduate of Masters of Arts in Economy. She is also a licensed trekking guide. She has uh, remained president at Kya Gani of Nepal, a non-profit agency for two years. She worked as a program associate at the proposal for NGOs. Along with this, she has been working as a lecturer for the past two years. She is also the founding member of and the coordinator of Society of Nepalese Women in Economics. She believes travel means to me to explore within myself, to share the love and to accept the challenge and let the world to shape me. Wonderful, wonderful views. I really appreciate it. It is such a wonderful line in your profile. <laughs> so welcome you on uh, this webinar. Over to you, Ms. Bade. Thank you, Dr. Anukrati. Thank you so much. First of all, happy Women Entrepreneurship Day to all of the wonderful women. It's this, this is today's the uh, Women Entrepreneurship Day. Hope you all are doing well. And uh, good evening, it's, it's 7 near to 8 p.m. here from Nepal. I am Sazana Bhadel from the land of Himalayas and birthplace of Lord Gautam Buddha. I'm very delighted to present my country and my uh, company, Expo Hub Nepal and Girls Empowered by Travel Nepal, the NGO that um, empowers the girls in this uh, webinar is in Women in Tourism. And thank you, Reza, for this wonderful opportunity. So before I begin, I have a small video because I do not prepare the PPT or slides, but I want to showcase some beauty and that what I've been doing so far. So let me present the small clips that I've prepared.
thank you everyone for watching this wonderful video. Um, so, um, as, as you know, like Nepal, the tourism, how it started and how the women uh, involvement in the tourism. In 1953, when Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norway, Norge uh, scaled the mountain Everest and then after the tourism started in Nepal and Nepal became the new destination and hot spots for adventure seekers and cultural tourists in 1973 after Nepal government banned to sell the hashish marijuana because of high flow of hippies in Nepal. In 1960s, the tourists started coming to Nepal, but our government stopped because of the cultural sensitive things. So the, so the Nepal, the tourism in Nepal is very flourishing and uh, so many people are involved, but unfortunately it is male dominated and only the few women are benefited economi economically from this uh, sector. So according to our Nepal tourism statistics, there are more than 3,743 trekking agencies. <clears throat> okay, let me... Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. No, no audible. So there are like 4,200, uh, 4,214 mm -hmm. tourist guides and 17,760 guides like is me in Nepal. And too sad to say that 39.2% are female managers and only 30.2% are owners. Like is, is it means that to be the owner of the trekking agency or tourism industry, they have to have their own trekking agency. That is very sad part. And so this is why that Girls Empower Ray Travel Nepal, that NGO, it's an NGO nonprofit organization that empowers the girls and young women through travel. If you want to, in, if you want to see that more girls can explore themselves and see the changes themselves, and also we want we are working in the sustainable tourism initiative like after the covid after covid and after the earthquake 2015 that we had to go with we had to go through with so many problems and the sustainable tourism initiative helps the women to start their own business through the community homestay training through the networking and marketing training and in one of the villages like uh, one of the very famous trekking trails, it's Lantang. So we had the training, uh, community homestay training for them in 2019. And after the 2019 training, they were about to start the, their own homestays as they were expecting the more guests. Certainly the COVID happened. But after this two years of like not doing thing, anything, but they are back again with the hopes, uh, like with the, with the hopes so they can... Uh, resume their business and the through the Girls Empower Travel Nepal, we are providing them opportunities to uh, to start their business and giving them the homestay concept, uh, networking, marketing. So it looks like uh, tourism sector is growing, but like recently, while we went to one of the villas, like uh, homestay villas, like homestay is the place where guests are hosted hosted as family members. Where, while we were there, like we stayed there in the homestay and everything was served by women. We were like, uh, we were like uh, welcomed by our guests, our, our women from, in, from the community homestay. And while we were able to give them money, the male member came into there to receive the money. And that really saddened us like, while we ourselves, we are working for the women empowerment in economic sectors, mostly in the tourism sector, the, the male sector, the male, uh, our male members are always there for the economic, you know, economic involvement. So we are trying to create that network, that community, so the women can feel that, feel the ownership of the tourism through our project, the Sustainable Tourism Initiative. And... So myself is I'm as I um, as I want to see like I I still I'm myself a trekking guide and I've organized uh, lots of trekking and food tours ethnic tours but you know while you are in the mountains with the guest uh, during the peak season uh, when there are so many guests and you have to you are given a one bed one room like dining hall you have to be in the dining hall then you need to share the bed with you so that is the sad reality that I faced being a trekking guide like while while I 
advocate for the advocate for the women empowerment i felt so lost and i felt so demotivated because our government or the hostel uh, homestay owners or hotel owners they do not feel they do not feel like we are the part of the business so so the government policies um, has to be reformed like that, that it will be it should be very friendly encouraged for the women in our sectors and we feel the lack of practical hands-on training like wilderness courses and map reading courses we should be easily accessible and affordable we female guides are really in the in the need of the outdoor education so it insecure in in lack of like security or safety so we can defend ourselves and also we feel the lack of like concept of resilient uh, resilient concept in the tourism sector so what can we do like i won't i won't take here a long time because i i think everyone has been tired listening and looking at the laptop so i would like to concise my uh, presentation so i think that being a traveler i would request to everyone let's be a responsible travel responsible traveler like focusing on the women led enterprises you can be the part of women led enterprises as nepal has so many things to offer it's not only the mountains when you are in nepal in nepal then you can be involved in uh, women led enterprises businesses and you can be the part of the un unconventional travel and also you can lower the footprints like carbon footprints because in one sector tourism is looked as like very uh, very accepted uh, business, but at the same time, it is creating so many carbon footprints. And I think being a traveler or responsible travel, we need to lower the carbon footprints and being a uh, responsible traveler, we need to be involved in those activities that is really immersive and that is very cultural. Go and talk with the local women and uh, like be their, be their life, like uh, experience their lifestyles. It is so amazing. It is so spiritual as well. And we need that big networks and community that support women startups and business. So thank you so much. Um, so this thank is my... You. <laughs> what I wanted to present. And if you are in Nepal, we have this uh, organization Girls Empower Travel Nepal that we empower the girls and we, we provide the opportunities to explore from very, very rural areas of Nepal. We give them training. And so after the training or workshop, they go back to their own communities and they execute the projects. And through the Expert Hub Nepal, you can uh, look at the different social media platforms. We organize uh, different unconventional travel that women are, women led these tours like ethnic and food tour, you know, art, uh, art tanga workshops, so those kind of things. So let's create these strong networks that we can support each other and uh, let's feel the, let's be a responsible traveler. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Bharel. Very nice presentation and very practical also. I have been to Nepal in 2018. And uh, I must say Nepal, although it is a small country uh, than India, but they are doing better than India, especially in accessible tourism. I have really noticed it. I have meticulously observed these things. Like I stayed over here for four days, five days, and it was for an accessible tourism conference I visited. And they are doing so wonderful things and the facilities which they have, you know, available for uh, the differently able persons are really marvelous. And I really want if you have some type of projects which are related with especially accessible tourism and even for, for homestays, please do share with me because I really want to conduct these small projects in the different rural areas, especially for the homestays. Like in uh, Northern India, we do have homestays, but if you talk about the state from which I belong, like Rajasthan, we have no culture of homestays so far. But, uh, you know, it is a good thing to make the community engagement and community participation. So please do share some uh, projects if we have, and I would love to join hand with you on this. Thank you so very much for being with us. Thank now, you, Arati. Thank you so much. I thank will you. To reach out to you. Bye -bye. So now with this, for the last speaker, now we are almost on the end of uh, the webinar today. Of um, And uh, before we close this particular webinar, you know, I would like to say the man behind the success of this particular webinar is Dr. Reza Sultani. He was a marketing the psychologist and uh, from Belgium and he speaks fluently seven languages and he has been working in three continents and visited more than 100 countries and he's the specialist in destination marketing, digital tourism and branding 
and he is the founder of tourism webinar so because of him only we all are together on this juncture on this platform today he is the co he has co-founded the peace festivals international as well and he is the director of peace tourism international and reza is the director of communication and international relations of international institute for peace through tourism and for the vote of thanks and for the closing i would like to invite the founder of tourism webinar dr reza over to you please thank you so much thank you dr sharma you have done a great job i think without you we couldn't uh, do that i want to thank also all the speakers from around the world that they joined us uh, from Australia, I know it was uh, quite late for her and for the others from Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, thank you so much, Indonesia, India. You all, all great. And uh, without the women's, there is no tourism. That's uh, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> and we have seen that. Also, I want to thank my great friend, uh, Dr. Talab Rafai, uh, Geoffrey Lipman, is still here. Also, Mr. Dorji from uh, Tourism Board of uh, Bhutan. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. And thank you, really, for all the speakers and Dr. Sharma that has done so much work. And I know you have spent lots of time for this. Thank you so much. So if there is any questions or anybody has a comments, please. I think uh, there is like no, no question okay. from anyone, okay. but uh, but yes, uh, before we will uh, close and go offline, I would like to request you, Dr. Reza, to organize such webinars sure. as much as you can because you. Uh, yeah. because you know I I got some messages in the chat box and uh, uh, the <laughs> audiences, the participants, they have requested us to make these webinars every week. Though it is a very tough task, this yeah. is only you and me who can realize and it know is, it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it is just my duty to inform yeah. you that we got this master's days also that they want every week such webinars, and I think it is very much required. Maybe yeah. with different different yeah. team members, we may organize yeah. such webinars and give opportunities to the youngsters. Like uh, today, we have given opportunity to Monica, which was like really good. And I want that the youngsters with the seniors uh, like Pratibhani, Professor, you know, Ki, uh, Ms. Kial and all yeah. with us today and uh, Professor Lipman with us, Professor Refi with yeah. us. So, you know, in their guidance, I think these youngsters will grow yeah. and they will learn a lot. In fact, we will also learn a lot. Yeah. So I also request you for the same that try okay. to make it as much as you can. And there is a request from one of the participants for the certificates as well. So I'm just bringing sure. in your kind of I'm sorry, if I may say, just the recording will be available from tomorrow, including the biography of all the speakers. You can also contact them and their page. So everything is very easy to find the speakers. But before we go, I, want, I see that Talib is back here again. Talib, I, do you want to say something? Uh, Thank closing. you so much, Riz. Thank, thank you so you. much, Riz. Yeah, thank you. I want to say two things. There is no webinar. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Riz. You're doing a great job. I thank want to thank, thank every, you. each and every one of the people that uh, presented today. Thank you, Professor. all the women, all the great women that that. Thank you so present. much. <laughs> Starting from the lady from Uzbekistan, ending with the lady from Nepal. I don't remember all their names, but I can. Go back to the Dr. Recording. Dr. Mastura from Uzbekistan. From her, we started yeah. and we have ended to Nepal yeah. with Miss Bhadela, if I'm not wrong, Sanjana. Yeah. Yes. Uzbekistan so. is a wonderful country. So is Bali. It is. It is. So is Indonesia. Bali is wonderful. Uzbek Thank is you. Uh, Uzbekistan, Thank you. Uzbekistan is a country that I visited many times. And I was in Thank Tashkent you. with the with your president, actually. And I told him one Thank thing we because we, he, he invited me to the music festival in Samarkand. And uh, I was sitting next to him and he asked me, what do I think about it? I said, look, we were dancing and singing at a time where the rest of the world was living in the Middle Ages, really. So I'm talking to you from Amman, Jordan now. Amman, Jordan, Jordan is a country in the Middle East. It's a country that has so much trouble in it. But I want to say something to all our good speakers. You are too polite. All of you are too polite, I think. 
I was worried about participating today because I thought I'd say some things that may be a bit radical, but I really think that there is no difference at all between men and women. The fact that we are doing this seminar means that there are still differences. And I also appreciate the lady that talked about religion, especially Islam, which I belong to, and, and tourism and women, women in tourism. Because I think that we need to be a bit more radical about this. We need to be, we need to face this to its, up, to its extreme and say that women are equal to, to men, simply as simple as that. So no, nobody has any reference on anybody else. We're, when we heard about women in Indonesia, for example, and how they are, have to take the permission of their husbands to work. They have to take permission from their families to work. Why is that okay for women, not okay for men? I don't understand that. Why does a man, can a man can work whenever he wants and a woman has to take a permission? I think that's not, that's not how the world is living today. It's a problem also of developed countries. Developing countries in general are much backward in treating their women, as you will see, because most of the people that spoke spoke from developing countries, except the lady from France, which was uh, a bit of a radical presentation, and I like that very much. I'm only saying this because I feel a bit obliged to say so. I think women are very equal to men. I was Minister of Tourism in my own country a long time ago, the year 2000. And I say that I, the most thing I'm proud of is that when I came in the workforce in Jordan, there were few women that work in the hospitality industry. When I left, it was 70% of the people that worked were women. That's an achievement. And I think we all have to look at that and see what, what it has produced. Thank you very much. I can go on more, more in this thing, but I have to really leave. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much, uh, Professor, for your wonderful words. It's listening to you is always uh, inspiring and encouraging. So I uh, think can, we can had I, a can very... I just Can I just say one word before you close? Yes, sure, sure, um, which is Which is, again, uh, to my friend Taleb Rifai, I happen to perhaps be the only person in this seminar who knows what a wonderful woman he has in Nizarin who actually yeah. enables him to do all the things that he can do. So yeah. he's got a very That's special right. set of circumstances. That's right. That's right. Very true. Very true. She's a wonderful lady <laughs> I have at home. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Thank you. So, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, we got a um, message from Monica for having a photograph. So I request everyone to open your uh, videos if it is possible at all for everyone because she just sent the message in the chat box for a formal photo. Please be ready, everyone. Kindly open your video cameras, please. And after this formal photo, this webinar will be ended with a word of thanks. Thank you so very much to each and everyone who are with us so far till the end of this webinar. Thank you so much. We are here from last more than like two and a half uh, hours. Oh. It's a great challenge, but it is exciting. Seriously. Thank you so much, everyone. And I hope someone has clicked this photograph. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. From tomorrow, the recording will be available bye. and uh, also the photos and everything. Don't worry. Bye -bye. Thank, thank you, you so much, much everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.